So I'm Jared. I work for Khan Academy, which is an online education nonprofit. And we're working to build a free world-class education for anyone anywhere. I do mobile and React Native and web development. If you want to follow along these slides, uh, this URL at the bottom is a copy of them. And I'm at Jared Forsyth on Twitter. So reason. I call it JavaScript flavored OCaml. Because it's, it's a layer on top of OCaml, which is this powerful, well-typed, very strong and secure language. Uh, it's been around for 20 years. But it's been kind of a small community. Uh, it has a lot of influence from academia and, and less um, emphasis on kind of being accessible to the broader community. So we're, we're trying to bring it out and make it accessible for all of you to get in on this goodness. So to start out, why? reason. Now, the, the quote that I like to fall back on is that we want, to, we want people to be able to use this awesome language at work and not just in their free time. A lot of times, you know, we're, we're at work, we're JavaScript developers, we were getting bogged down, and it's like, oh, I know what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to break out Elm. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relax. I'm going to get some, like, really nice typed code. Um, but then you... Oftentimes, you can't bring it to work. And at work, you're, you're bogged down. So the, the goal of this is to make it so that everybody can, can use this at their day job. And in order to deliver on that, I'm going to focus on two things, adoption and maintenance. So in other words, make it easy to get started and easy to keep going. Now, these two things can sometimes be in conflict, actually. With, with JavaScript, we know um, it it's really easy to get started. You know, you just open the console and start banging away. But then in, in our jobs, if you're working on a large code base, if you're working with a lot of people, it can get much harder to maintain, much harder to develop than some of these other languages. And um, several years ago, I was working on a, a large application written in Angular. When I started out with Angular, I was really excited about it because it was so easy to start. Right, you've got your HTML page, and maybe you're doing jQuery or you're doing Backbone at the time. And suddenly, you put in a script tag, you add an attribute to your DOM element, and you're off and running. Like You can get a form going in like 45 seconds. And that was really cool, so much easier than the current state of the art. But then, as I said, I was working on this large Angular application, many thousands of lines of code, many other developers. And it actually really bogged me down. I was getting really down about it because Anytime I wanted to add a feature, anytime I wanted to uh, fix a bug, I would, I would go into the code base and it's like, OK, so here is, here's the, the bug. Here's where the problem is. And then I'd have to read through like several thousand lines of code to make sure that nobody else was mutating this data. Because like, the, the way that the code had grown, it, Angular didn't provide the structure to make it maintainable in the long run. Um, and as I was saying, JavaScript started out so easy to develop. Um, but then over the past couple of years, JavaScript's gotten a little bit more difficult. I love this quote. So uh, somehow we, we went from you write some JavaScript in the console, you drop it in index.js, put the script tag in your HTML, and you're off and running. But these days, you, know, you, you install Node, you configure Babel, you install React, Webpack, all of these things together to finally get your app into production. And these changes weren't made so that it would be easier to start, clearly. They were made because people were writing large web apps in production, and they're like, actually, this is really hard to maintain. Let's add some tools. Let's add some configuration. Let's add some things so that we can, so that the maintenance gets easier. But all, along the way, we've, we kind of really made adoption a lot harder. Um, and so we get JavaScript fatigue. And so to combat that, there was Create React App. There were various boilerplates that sprang up. And so it's always kind of a, a fine line you're trying to, to balance on between adoption and maintenance. And I like, I like visual things. So here's I kind of tried to put a bunch of languages up on a chart. Now, this disclaimer, this is all fake. I made this up. Um, I, I gave this talk a couple days ago, and people got mad that their favorite language wasn't on there. Um, but we have JavaScript in the bottom right corner. So very easy to adopt. Um, and I'm going to call that the baseline of ease of maintenance. Right? It's, it's easier to maintain than assembly, yes. Um, but that's not what we're talking about. ES6 
um, kind of with, with all the features that we added, with let and const and arrow functions, it made it harder to get started, but it made it easier to work on large projects. And then if you add Flow or TypeScript, you, again, the, the barrier to entry is a little bit higher, but then you can have more confidence in your code in the wild. And then Haskell and OCaml are kind of up here on the like really powerful, give you a lot of security and structure and um, incredibly powerful tools sometimes to maintain your code. But learning it is really, really hard. Um, getting into that, uh, especially if you're, if you're coming from JavaScript, from Java, from Python, any of these, um, the documentation's not there. The tooling is really hard to, to set up in many cases. And so Elm has kind of taken Has Haskell and said, let's, let's make this easier to adopt. Let's cut down the feature set a little bit, actually. And in, in the meantime, making it easier to maintain as well. So Elm is like, we will focus very specifically on building web UIs. Um, we're going to make it the best possible experience, easy, so much easier to adopt than, than the current um, well-typed languages, and also easy to maintain in the long run. And then Reason is coming from the other direction, where we, we want to push maximum on adoption, make it as easy as possible to come to Reason with your existing JavaScript code base, and then we compromise on maintainability a little bit more. Elm, for example, doesn't have runtime exceptions in, as part of the language. We do. Um, to, and it, it merges better with JavaScript from that perspective, but then you know, suddenly there's more stuff to think about uh, when you're maintaining. So the things that we're doing to ease adoption, I'm going to talk about syntax, I'm going to talk about tools, I'm going to talk about JavaScript interop. Syntax is actually really funny because everybody has an opinion about, you know, my syntax is best, pretty much. Um, and over the past couple of months, we've been making some changes to the reason syntax, um, moving it away from the ML style, uh, Elm, Haskell, uh, OCaml, and moving it more towards C style, so JavaScript, Java, that kind of thing. And all these people are coming in saying, no, 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 stop doing that. Well, you're making it worse. Also, syntax doesn't matter. Why are you focusing on this? Um, and it's, it's funny, because you can't have both. It can't be you're doing it wrong, and it doesn't matter. Um, and I, I think, personally, actually, it does matter. Um, and Cheng Liu, who's one of the, the leads on this project, said something that I really like. And the point is for, to allow others to convince their bosses without getting blocked on the little things like syntax, like documentation. Um, because it turns out, if you're, if you're coming to your team and you're saying, hey, here's this new thing, by the way, I'm going to have to spend half an hour before you can even read it. And also there's types, and also there's immutability. It's just so much more difficult than to say, hey, the syntax is pretty much the same. We can forget about that. Let's focus on the good stuff. So here's kind of a, a visual for you of how we've moved the syntax over the past year and a half or so. On the left is OCaml. Um, and you'll see that function application, the way you call a function, uh, there's no kind of uh, syntax involved. It's just the function name, argument one, argument two, spaces in between. Um, and there aren't any curly braces. Block scope is kind of defined via some actually kind of complex rules that are hard to um, look at, in my opinion. And so the, the middle one was the first version of reason syntax, where we added curly braces. Um, so that it's easier to tell, OK, what is the scope? What's inside this function? And then on the far right, we added parentheses. Um, and the, the parentheses were what people were getting stuck on. They're like, no, like, it's so much cleaner. It's so much clearer that you're doing currying if you don't have these weird parentheses in the way. Uh, and I was talking to a, a friend who really likes Lisp syntax. And he was like, I love parentheses, but they're in the wrong place. Right? You, you put them on the outside. So you can't please everyone. But um, my, my, I'm confident that this will make it much easier to get into reason coming from JavaScript. And there was a, a speaker down in Sydney, Australia, who was talking about how she and her team had integrated reason into production. And I loved it when she said, it almost wasn't like learning a new language. It was just, we already have basically JavaScript and then a couple of new rules, some new help from the compiler, some new uh, assistance to make sure that you're writing stuff that will be maintainable in the long run. So the second thing is tooling. Uh, we wanted to stick with the JavaScript ecosystem as much as possible. So package management is NPM. Um, if you're going to bundle your JavaScript, feel free to use Webpack, Rollup, 
if you're onto the new ES6 module imports and you're running Safari, you don't even have to bundle. You just do the import thing and it works. And then formatting, if you're already used to Prettier, we've got reformat, um, which was actually the inspiration for Prettier. And so that gets rid of all of your linting, nitpicks on, oh, you put the comma in the wrong place. Um, it just formats everything in a canonical style. And these next three, linting, transpiling, boilerplate, you don't need it. Um, we, in, in going into this, we wanted to make it as simple as possible, um, just bake everything in that has been established in the JavaScript community over the past several years. And there's been all these boilerplates and all these new tools that have come out, and we're consolidating it so you, you don't even have to have a Create React app. You don't have to eject. It's just there, and it's simple, and it works. So JavaScript interop is, is the other thing that is um, kind of the, there are a lot of perspectives on that. If you look around at compiled to JavaScript languages, and the goal from Reason's perspective is to make it as painless as possible to take your existing JavaScript, add in Reason a little bit at the time. Um, and I, I tried to graph the, the spectrum of perspectives on this. And with, with Elm on the far side, where Elm's philosophy is kind of keep JavaScript at arm's length. Um, JavaScript is dangerous, and it has all these bugs, and so it, it's best to um, you know, not get too close to it so that you protect your code. So if you want to call a JavaScript function or call a JavaScript library from Elm, you have to set up kind of a message passing protocol. And there's serialization and deserialization. Um, and if JavaScript returns something that's in the wrong shape, it stops at the door. It, it doesn't infect your code. And the Elm ecosystem, it, they have their own package management. They, they don't um, mesh with NPM, because NPM has all these crazy packages that are frequently very broken, and you kind of want to stay away from that. ClojureScript, then, um, has easier JavaScript interop syntactically, but again, they're, they're also um, not tied to the NPM ecosystem as much. Um, they, they use kind of the Java package management. So then Reason has both of those. We have the, the nice syntax for easily integrating with JavaScript, and if you want to include an NPM module, it's quite easy. Now, the, the closest side to JavaScript is with Flow and TypeScript, where it's like it's, it's really pretty much JavaScript semantics. Um, so you don't even have different value um, runtime representations. And, um, but then you get all the baggage that JavaScript has, where it's like, oh, sometimes there's unsound types because Flow and TypeScript have to accommodate current JavaScript idioms. So here's some examples of what it looks like to use JavaScript in Reason. Um, and you might be looking at this and say, actually, that's completely JavaScript. And it is. Um, this is a multi-line string where I just dumped in a snippet of code that I copied from the documentation of the web audio API. Because I was working on this uh, project where I wanted to make a beep, I wanted to make some noises, and the web audio API is cool. So I was looking it up in the documentation, playing around the REPL. And then I had code that was working in JavaScript, and I didn't want to take the time to translate it into my language, to figure out the types, to make it all work well. I had something that worked. I just want to dump it in and keep going. And that's what I love about this raw JavaScript support, where definitely it's dangerous. And I'll tell you, nine times out of 10 that I've used this, there's been like a syntax error or a type error in the JavaScript that I put in there, um, which you get what you pay for. Um, but this is great for starting out. When you're just learning and you want to keep going, you want to get a win. Raw JavaScript can also be typed. You can also pass in arguments to these functions. You can then um, get return values. So there, there's a lot of flexibility here. But again, this is more power than you actually want in production. You want safety. You want structure. And so for that, there's the externals API, where you say, from this module, this is an example, me integrating with Firebase. And I said, there's this Firebase NPM module. And here's how you get out the authenticated user. And there are a couple of steps. There are a couple of types that I declare. Um, and then at the bottom, I show the JavaScript that BuckleScript compiles it into uh, quite cleanly. So the basic idea is have an easy mode to get started, to, to make the interop as smooth as possible. If you get stuck, just dump in some JavaScript. And then later on, you can go clean it up. You can make it rig rigorous. You can translate the logic into reason and then just use externals for any NPM modules you're working with. So if it's really easy to, op 
adopt, it still doesn't do you any good if the language doesn't end up having the supports that you need for maintenance, right? So the second part is make it easy to maintain. I'm going to talk about several things that OCaml, kind of the, the structure that we're building on, gives us for free. And it's very powerful, very well developed, starting with the type system. So there, there are just so many awesome things that you get by having a good type system at your disposal. Um, quick to, to get an idea of, of who's here, who uh, would love to, be, to use a, like a statically, type, type, statically checked type system at work or are already? Cool. All right. This is better than, than it would have been last year. Um, who, who's going to need a lot of convincing to use types? In your, in your JavaScript or in your, wow. OK, I can almost skip this slide, but it's good stuff. So types give you free documentation, um, where at the top, this is like the JavaScript doc that you might write. And then in the middle is flow annotations you could give. At the bottom is really cool, because I didn't write those types. Those were filled in by reasons type inference. It said, oh, I know what these types are. And then VS Code has this fun feature where it'll just kind of add, add that line above each of your top-level declarations. So this, this will never, never get stale, and you don't have to spend the time maintaining it. For, for people that are not so excited about types, um, frequently it comes from experience in Java and C++, where it's like, oh, I spend so much time just messing with these types. I want to get on and write some code. Um, and using Reason, using Elm, where it's um, almost completely inferred, it doesn't even get in your way. I saw this great quote about unit tests, where unit tests can cover the things you can think of. Now, if you're using generative testing, as was explained earlier, it, it's a little bit broader, but it still only tests the functions that you can figure out how to write a test for, whereas types cover everything, even the things you forgot about. And in turn, types have a smaller surface area, right? They, they can't test all of the things that you can test with unit tests. But it's so nice to have that just have your back. And then immutability um, gives you so many more guarantees about your code, makes it easier to basically sleep well at night. Um, there's less spooky action at a distance, because in many cases, it's just um, ruled out. Right? If, you, if you get an object, you don't have to worry about somebody else changing it because it's impossible to modify. And then you can reason about how a value changes over time. My example from the Angular code base, where everything was mutable and everything mutated everything else, the problem was I didn't know how we got here. You know, I, I jump into the Chrome DevTools, and it's like, OK, this is, this is the current value. How in the world did that happen? If you have immutability, it's so much easier to trace it down. But the thing where reason sets itself apart from Elm, from Haskell, is that there is mutability if you need it. Um, and this can happen if you are in a tight loop, if you have, you know, you're iterating over tens of thousands of things and you want to just mutate, you just want to, you know, make an array instead of using a linked list that has the immutable properties. And sometimes code is easier to read and write if you're coming from an imperative background. Um, so that, that can be nice for, for onboarding as well. And the other thing is that Reason is multi-platform. Um, and I think this, this will get a lot more attractive in the near future. You might be thinking that JavaScript is multi-platform, right? You know, we've got Node.js. You can make a server. We've got, you can make JavaScript fly a drone for you. Um, so JavaScript is everywhere, but it's not fast. Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily get the speed that you need, especially if you're running a large server. And so there, there are many companies that have started out with JavaScript. And it's like, oh, yeah, we've got the same language on the back and the front. It's awesome. And then the day comes when you have to turn to your team and say, we're going to have to rewrite it in Go. We're going to have to rewrite it in Rust or Clojure or something that will give us better performance characteristics. But if you start with Reason, then, then what you're doing is you say, OK, we've been co compiling this to JavaScript and Node. Let's compile it to native. We're going to have to change the libraries we use. right? We can't use NPM modules if we're, if, we're, if we're compiling to native. But at least you keep the same language on the front and the back. You can have types that make sure that your REST endpoints will never return unexpected data because it's checked all the way around. 
And the final thing that I'm really excited about with Reasons compilation is the, the compiler takes advantage of the types that you get and the immutability, and it cuts out a lot of work. Here I've got some, some Reason code on the left, so the output JavaScript on the right. And if you look at the result line, um, it's interesting because there's, it's calling function do something complex, but on the right, it's just the constant 14. So BuckleScript went in and said, oh, this function doesn't do anything interesting, and it's only used once. Let's inline it. Add 2 doesn't do anything interesting. Let's inline it twice. Also, plus 2, I can do that. So it's just 14.2 string instead of making several function calls. And the bottom, I think, is even more fun because we, we have a value. It's a string. We put it inside of an object. Then we get it out of the object. And the compiler sees that and says, it can't have changed because it's immutable. Let's just grab it from the beginning. And this is a simple example, but I've seen it in the, the JavaScript that I've output where BuckleScript has taken a bunch of shortcuts that will really um, give me performance in the long run. So essentially, Reason has the structure, it has the safeguards and tooling to keep your code friendly in the long run, but it has flexibility if you need it. Right? It has mutability if you need the speed. People come up to me and say, OK, Reason is awesome. I want to use it. I've got a team of 15 people. We've got this large JavaScript app. How do I get started moving it over? And for the past many months, I've said, hold off, because this is a, this is a young project. There's a lot of churn. Um, we've changed the syntax a lot in the past several months. We've changed the build tooling a lot, added features, trying to make it stable, um, changed the editor integration, which is really cool now, but has been flaky for a while. But now, there are, there are several teams that are shipping React in production. You know, there, there are React native apps running with Reason in the App Store. There are websites built on React. There are um, server-side tools running in Reason. Um, but if you're a large team, so for example, I work at Khan Academy. We've got 50 or 60 developers. I'm going to hold off on bringing in Reason for at least another year because it, there's still some churn. It's still on the early edge of adoption. Um, today or tomorrow, we're shipping the new syntax, so it'll be easier to teach. And we're working on building the documentation and all the tools that you'll need. Um, but, but it's still kind of in the earlier side. If you're familiar with Rust and that language's progression, I like to compare Reason to Rust two or three years ago. That was when I got interested in it. And it was really cool. A really fun language, but there were some weird, there were like four different types of pointer. Um, and the documentation was kind of struggling some places, and there wasn't really a lot of community resources, not very many libraries. But now, Rust is something that you can be confident, like there's going to be good libraries um, for most of the things you want to do. The syntax is well oiled. They've put a lot of effort into making it accessible and easy to adopt. And that's where I hope to have reason in the next two years. So what are the things that's left? We need to solidify the standard library. This is kind of a, a funny thing. OCaml uh, has like five different standard libraries, which means it's actually not all that standard, right? Um, so we, we want to bake in a library to the compiler, make it so that everyone's using the same thing. There's a lot of community work to be done, bindings to popular JavaScript packages, and building up the community packages so that there's an easy way to get started writing a server, easy ways to get started making games, and all that. And then there's the blog posts, the tutorials, uh, and various documentation. So if you're excited about this, if you're convinced that this uh, is a language to invest in, please come join us. And thank you. <laughs>